Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. I'm Jody Cartwright. I'm the pastor here at Dwajak First United Methodist Church. And it is wonderful to see so many people here. We've had the De Colores people here this past week, weekend. Um, and they're staying with us for worship and have brought some of their family members. So it's great to see all of you. If you have any questions or need anything during the service, the ushers in the back will be more than happy to, to help you with those needs, direct you where you need to go. I have a couple of announcements I wanted to share with you today. First of all, we're not gonna do Bible study this morning. There's just too much going on. It's been too busy of a week. The Thursday folks didn't meet this week, so we're just gonna go ahead and move this week's lesson to this coming Thursday and do Thursday and Sunday again next week, like it's this week. So um, we'll be looking for you either Thursday morning or next Sunday morning. Also, um, Becky Peters has an announcement, something she wants to share with us. I didn't know until about five minutes ago that I had to say something. <laughs> um, last week, my youngest son, Jared, announced that he was in the musical at the middle school this week, this weekend, and so I would like to invite you all, and we have a short clip of Friday night's show that Dan's going to show you what's going on. Picture this, a rustic hunting lodge. My latest kill, roasting over the fire. My little wife, massaging my feet. While the little ones play on the floor with the dogs. Oh, we'll have six or seven. Dogs? No, Belle, strapping boys like me. Imagine that. I can see that we will share all that love implies We shall be the perfect pair Rather like my thighs You are face to face with destiny All roads lead to the best things in life Are all's well that ends with me Escape me, there's no way certain 
is do re bell when you marry. So bell, what will it be? Is it yes or is it oh yes? Okay, that was my youngest, if you can believe that. That was Jared, singing, singing. And Belle is played by Emily Potter. She used to go to church here for a while. Her grandmother is Nancy Potter. There's a lot of kids in the play that you guys know. Um, today at 2 o'clock, $7 for everybody, and then seniors are $5. Um, anything I'm forgetting, dear? Yeah, we got to wait and see if Belle marries him, and if you guys have watched the movie, you know, but... Um, <laughs> So yeah, come and join us at 2 o'clock. It was awesome. Ask anybody that was there um, Friday night. Um, I can't believe my child is actually singing. So if you want to see my child singing, come on and see him singing. You know, I think it's so important that we support the children in our community. And while not all the kids in the play go to church here, so many of them have connections, either through friends or relatives, um, grandparents. So please, if, if you um, are so inclined, go out and, and support, support our high school kids in this, um, in this play. Um, in case you're wondering why we're not using our organ, we have had some of the pipes out for repair for the last couple of weeks. We're hoping that we're going to have everything back and in working order by next week. But in the meantime, Linda Campbell has been doing a wonderful job playing the piano for us. So thank you, Linda, for stepping up. And of course, we're grateful to have our organ back in working order when that happens as well. And finally, I, I mentioned that DeColoris had been here. Um, Corey Blocker um, has been involved in leading this group, and he's going to come tell us a little bit about what they've been doing. All right, guys, this is my co-rector, uh, Bill Dixon. Um, <laughs> uh, Bill and I would like to thank uh, the church here for allowing us to use it. Um, we really appreciate it, and uh, especially the Day of Course community also appreciates it. Um, we want to share a gift with you guys, uh, what we call palanca. It's uh, palanca in Spanish means lever. So it's something to lift uh, the men up on the weekend and women on their weekend. And um, so we want to share our theme song with you guys. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
much. That was wonderful. Now, if you would like to um, greet those around you in the name of Christ. a minute. Let us rise for the call to worship. Please stand as you're able. Welcome to the fabulous feast that God has prepared. We come hungry, thirsty, and searching for God. God is near, full of power and glory. We are here to be fed by God's word. Lift up your hands in praise. Bless God who upholds us with God's strength. We will bless God as long as we live. Our opening hymn is There's a Wilderness in God's Mercy. The words would be on the wall, and it's uh, 121 in the hymnal.
seated. And now, trusting in God's love and mercy for us, let us confess our sins before God and before each other. Let us pray together. Nurturing one, you invite us to feast on your word and to be filled with your love. Your banquet is always before us, freely offered for us to enjoy. Yet we choose to spend our resources on things that do not satisfy. Forgive us when we consume the very things that do not feed us. Help us abandon our careless ways and self-seeking schemes that we might return to you, our provider and sustainer. God is faithful and will not allow us to be tempted beyond our abilities. Even in our brokenness, God provides a path to wholeness. When we confess our shortcomings, God has mercy on us and is generous with forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And now, as we prepare to hear the word of the Lord, let us listen as the choir sings.
Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 through 9. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen. Listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not. And nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. For he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 63, verses 1 through 8. Let's read this together responsibly. O oh God, you are my God. I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where no water is. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. My soul is feasted as with marrow and fat, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I think of you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized in Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things, as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way so that you can endure it. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Please rise as you're able in honor of the reading of the gospel.
Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but didn't find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then you cut it down. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And please be seated. So, so not to be too much about Beauty and the Beast. I did go and see the show last night, and it's, and it's really good. But I have to admit, I haven't sat and watched the Disney cartoon since my kids were little. And um, I think I'd forgotten how much the story was about the ways that love is able to redeem us. You know, a quick plot summary now, if you um, don't know the story. The prince is mean to an enchantress. She disguises herself as a beggar. He refuses her. And she puts a curse on the house and on his household and on him and turns him into this hideous beast. And to break the curse, he has to basically show love to another person, and that person needs to return the love to him. In the story, I think we see how Belle is initially frightened and repulsed by the beast. But she's able to give him a second chance. And ultimately, she's able to see that person who's hidden inside that beastly cover. And we have to see the beast make efforts to learn lessons here too, learn how to control his self-centered anger, learn how to love another person again, you know, learn how to take her feelings, her desires into consideration. And spoiler alert now, if you haven't seen the show and you're going this afternoon and don't want to be spoiled, cover your ears real fast. But the curse is broken in the end. And, you know, as I watched the show last night, it occurred to me how much it fit into our topic today. How repentance involves us taking the time and making the effort to see our world in a new and in a different way. And then ultimately letting these understandings transform us and transform our lives. Now, I know repentance isn't a subject that many people are interested in talking about. I mentioned to someone what the topic of this week's sermon was, and they're like, oh, that's a great subject. And I get where that comes from. I mean, we talk about repentance, and we're usually attaching ideas of guilt and moral judgment to it. You know, we think of repentance as only something we do to get away from sin. And, and that is a big part of it. You know, the classic definition of repentance that I think many of us learned over the years is to turn around, to go the other way. But repentance is more than just a change in direction. It's also, it's a change of heart. It's a change in our lives. And it's a change in the way that we perceive and we respond to the world around us. Now, in our gospel reading today, Jesus is teaching the crowds again. And some of the people who are gathered around him tell him about this horrific slaughter of a group of Galileans who have gone to Jerusalem to worship. And they're in the temple when they're slaughtered. It says their blood ran together with the blood of sacrificial animals. Now they blame Pilate for the attack and no doubt there was some self-righteousness in their concern as they told the story. You know, think about this as maybe the kind of story that would 
dominate our 24-7 news cycle for at least a couple of days in today's world. You know, in that time and place, many people believed that God punished sinners with horrific events like this attack or with the t events like the Siloam Tower collapsing and killing 18 people. But, you know, I think we see that Jesus clearly shuts down this idea. He says, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? You know, do you think the people killed in the tower collapse were worse sinners than anybody else in Jerusalem? And on both counts, we hear Jesus say no. But then he also adds a but. He says, unless you repent, unless you change your hearts and your lives, you too will perish. You'll die just as they did. Neither of these events have any other historical mention in, in documents that we have. But it could have been that the people around Jesus were in some way implying that the Galileans deserved their fate. Because we do see historical mentions of Galileans who'd been responsible for leading uprisings against the Romans when they'd come to Jerusalem. So maybe Jesus is using this as a moment to point out hypocrisy. You know, maybe Jesus is saying to them, you think that God is punishing these Galileans for being sinful? And then in comparison, he asks about the people killed in the tower collapse. You know, were they any more sinful than the rest of the people in Jerusalem? And even today, when we have these big disasters, these big tragedies, there are people that look upon these things as divine, as, as divine punishment for sin. You know, the collapse of our own towers on 9-11, that was heralded by some in the world as punishment for the wanton lifestyle that our dominant American culture seems to push out into the rest of the world. But come on. We know that the people who were on those planes and in those buildings weren't any more sinful than the rest of us. And, you know, following Hurricane Katrina, there was a prominent televangelist that suggested that the city of New Orleans was essentially laid to waste because of the sins that it had transpired there. But again, we know that the folks that lived in New Orleans aren't any more sinful than the rest of us. You know, I think Jesus is telling us here that God does not deal with sin by horrifically destroying large groups of people or even individuals as punishment. And while we're puzzling over what all this might mean, I'll remind you that the folks that were listening to Jesus, they were probably equally as perplexed. So Jesus tells a parable. And he continues with this parable about the fig tree that's been planted in the vineyard. The landowner comes looking for fruit on the tree, and even after three years, he hasn't found any. So he tells his gardener, cut down this tree. It's a waste of space. It's a waste of the nutrients in the soil. But the gardener asks to give the tree another chance, another season to produce. And he says, you know, he'll nurture it. He'll dig around it. He'll spread manure around it and see if maybe it won't produce this next year. And then he tells the landowner that if it doesn't produce, he can cut it down. And there's so many questions about this parable, starting with, why was a fig tree planted in a vineyard? <laughs> and if it was expected to um, produce fruit on its own, why hadn't the gardener been nurturing it all along? So, as with any other parable, there aren't any really good, solid answers here. But I think in this parable, we can see a story of reprieve. The gardener asks for an opportunity to approach the care of the tree in a different way, with new attention to detail, with new attention to nurturing the tree, providing the nutrients, providing the care that it needs to be able to produce fruit. You know, we're seeing an example of repentance 
by the gardener. You know, maybe Jesus is pointing out that the idea of God using tragedy to punish sin is a human idea, not a godly idea. The idea of God punishing sin through tragedy might work out okay if we're using it to explain the plight of some other guy. But when it comes down to our lives and to our loved ones, I think that theory breaks down really fast because we all know people who have gone through horrific things in their lives and we know that they're good people. And then we also know people who clearly seem to us to be the epitome of evil and we see them prosper and we see good things happen to them. It just doesn't work to, to look at it that way. So maybe instead, this parable is more of an example of how God deals with sin by patiently giving us another chance to get it right, by patiently nurturing us, by providing us with what we need to have a deeper relationship with God, to have a deeper and more loving relationship with the people that are around us. And I think that's really what removing sin from our lives is all about. Taking down those barriers that we put between God and ourselves. Taking down the barriers that we put up to keep other people out. You know, barriers that keep us from being truly able to love each other. We can practice repentance in our own lives. We just need to have the patience and have the desire to allow God to nurture us, to, to dig around our roots a little bit, maybe even spread a little bit of manure around us. It might require us to move from where we are, you know, maybe to change the way we think about our relationship with God, about our relationship with with our neighbors, with the people around us. And, you know, change is uncomfortable. It can be difficult. It can be unpleasant and hard to get started sometimes. And practicing repentance, it might require us to change the way that we consider other people's needs and desires. It might require us to change the way we look at other situations the way we judge other circumstances. You know, while personal responsibility is a thing and natural consequences are reality, we don't really always know all that's involved in the decisions that others make and the events that have transpired to get them to where they are. You know, we just don't know enough about others to judge them. It's just not our job. But, you know, we do know that God extends untold amounts of grace towards us. God extends reckless amounts of love towards us. And Jesus extends this love and grace in the compassion that he had for the people who followed him around during his ministry. People who were in search of healing in search of release from the chains that bound them, whether those were physical chains, emotional chains, social chains. Jesus was willing to see people where they were. He was willing to look at them and see their hearts on the inside and not their rough exteriors on the outside. So if we are followers of Christ, don't you think we should be able to see people in the same way? Be willing to meet them where they are, to have compassion for them? To look for that heart inside their rough exteriors? Now, we don't know how the story of the fig tree ended. The, the vineyard owner might have gone ahead and just said, nope, cut it down, no chance. Um, maybe the tree did respond and grow fruit. Or maybe the gardener had to ask for yet another season to see if he could get the tree to give fruit. 
But the beginning of repenting is being able to see the need for change and then being willing to make a start on that change. The beginning of repenting is being willing and able to, receive, to, to perceive the world around us in a new way. And just in case you're thinking that it's a one and done prospect, you know, I'll, I'll dissuade you of that idea right now. <laughs> Instead, repentance is an ongoing process. It's like a course correction that's constantly taking place. It's this process of responding to this ever-changing world around us in a way that reflects God's love and God's grace for us. Now, the beast ultimately realized that if he was to have any chance at all in breaking this curse, that he was going to need to begin to treat Bell in a new and a different way. Now, it wasn't immediate. He had to work at it. And he had some setbacks along the way. But he was finally able to see Belle and treat her as a person with her own feelings and her own needs instead of just seeing her as an object that he could order around. And this fundamental change in the way he understood the world around him, this is what transformed him. Now, we sometimes find ourselves in this world of our own making, one that isolates us, one that binds us to our old ideas and our old habits, you know, one that distorts our thinking and obscures our behavior into this ugly, unloving way. And one that allows our fear of the other to get into the way of our ability to see all of God's children as individual people who have their own needs and their own desires. But you know what the wonderful thing is? We don't have to stay there. We don't have to stay in this world that we've created around ourselves. We can change. We can repent. We can allow God's love and God's grace to transform us, to show us this new way towards building the kingdom of God, this new way towards living in loving relationship with God and with each other. You know, Jesus calls us to open ourselves up to the opportunities we have to nurture each other, the opportunities that we have to help each other bear fruit. So I ask you this week, pray about what it might mean for you to practice repentance. And may the Spirit guide us all back in our journey back to God. May it be so. Amen. And now, as um, a response, let's sing hymn number 127, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Please rise as you're able.
please be seated. On the bulletin that you received, we list our prayer concerns each week, and I encourage you to take your bulletin with you and pray over these people as you go through your week, as you go through your devotions. Um, a few people who I wanted to um, kind of highlight for you this week. Betty Knapp is having some difficulties with um, her immune system and all of the things that go with the many different things that she has um, suffered and survived through over these many years. And she is having a particularly tough time right now. And she's asking for prayers for um, both her healing and her comfort and for her doctor's knowledge. Um, Carol Herter, who um, has been coming here for a while, is in the hospital right now. She um, has been having some issues with abdominal pain. And so they decided at the hospital to hold on to her over the weekend to see if they can come up with reasons for the pain, maybe a way to resolve it. So um, she'll be in there at least through Monday. So prayers for Carol as she recovers. Doug Wilsey has been suffering from cancer for about a year now. And he's had a recurrence of that cancer. And so we are holding Doug and his family in our prayers as well. Let's take time to be in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we are so grateful for the many, many gifts that you give us. God, we come to you with so many things on our hearts right now. We, we live in a world that is full of difficulties, that's full of, of tensions, of people not able to get along, people not able to show their love for each other in the way that you would have us. God, we ask you to be with the leaders of our nations, with the people that make decisions. We ask you to guide their hearts and their minds as they make decisions that benefit the many people who are in need of, of and, and, and not so much the many people who are already in power. God, we ask you to be with, with our local and national leaders as well as they make these decisions. Guide them as they, as they make choices that affect us all. God, we ask you to be with those among us who are suffering and who are in pain, those who are ill, those who are missing somebody. God, we raise up the names that we mentioned before, and we raise up the names that are on our hearts right now, as well as those who remain nameless. God, we're so grateful for the, all that you give us. We are especially grateful for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God's faithful love is a constant blessing. As we have been blessed, so may we now be a blessing to others. Will our ushers come forward for the offering?
Rise for the doxology. As we enjoy the rich feast you have provided, we know that there are those who want for food and drink. Multiply the offerings we share today that they may bless those in need. May the spiritual nourishment we receive today strengthen us for continued service. In your name, amen. We have a tradition at our church um, that when someone is in particular need of prayer, we pray over a prayer quilt for them. Kathy Hall has made this prayer quilt, and I think she's made most of them, actually. Um, I, mentioned, the makes them, I, do make more than I mentioned Doug Wiltsey um, and his wife, Mickey, earlier, and so we would like to pray over this quilt um, for Doug. I would invite all of you to come up and lay hands on the quilt or lay hands on the person in front of you as we pray. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we are so thankful for Doug Wiltsey's life, for all he's done for the life of the church. God, we are so saddened to hear of his cancer returning, to, to hear of the pain that he's suffering now. God, we ask you for comfort and for peace, for Doug, for Mickey, for his children, and, and for all who love and care for him. God, we ask for your healing touch. We ask you to, to relieve his pain. And we ask you to, to hold him tight, tight in your arms and comfort him and give him peace. God, we know that, that, that there are so many things we don't understand. And we know that... Um, you, you, you have your ways and you have your reasons for doing things. But God, we ask for your healing. We're so thankful for all that you give us and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we'll go ahead and deliver that to, to Doug and Mickey this week. Another tradition we have is that we normally circle around the sanctuary and sing our closing hymn. <laughs> However, I don't think that's going to work this week. Sure so I'm going sure to So I'm going to invite you to all stand where you are, take the hand of the person next to you, and their screens have the words on it over here on and in the back. So let's sing.
now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. Amen.